Daily Tech News Show is made possible by its listeners. Thanks to all of you, including Brad, Kevin, and Paul Thiessen. Coming up on DTNS, Scott Johnson tells us how the very small, very simple Playdate console is being received. Hint, well. Plus, generating energy from the night sky. And Netflix is forced to about face on just about everything it believes in. This is the Daily Tech News for Wednesday, April 20th, 2022 in Los Angeles. I'm John Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. In Salt Lake City, I'm Scott Johnson. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chen. Now, see, here in the United States, the way we backwardsly write uh, dates, it is 420. Ah, yeah. 420. Yeah. If only there was some significance. I feel like there was, but I can't remember. Such a Let's... cool number, I guess. <laughs> what was I going to do? Oh, let's start with a few tech things we should know. Google's AMP was supposed to make pages load faster, but a lot of folks see it as Google cutting out publishers. So the makers of the Brave browser announced a new feature called DAMP, which will automatically take users to the original page for any link to Google's accelerated mobile pages framework. Brave, Brave rewrites links and URLs when possible to avoid visiting AMP pages. Otherwise, it redirects users away from AMP pages before the page is rendered. DuckDuckGo also announced it will direct users to original publishers' web pages instead of AMP versions on its apps and extensions. Google's Project Zero security team detected and reported 58 zero-day vulnerabilities in use in the wild in 2021. That's more than double its previous record from 2015. The Project Zero team believed this large uptick was due to increased disclosures of vulnerabilities by software makers rather than actual increased usage by threat actors. So this is good news. They're catching more of them. It didn't mean there were more of them, if that makes sense. We're starting to descend a bit from the heights of tech sales during the pandemic. Canalyst estimates that the worldwide smartphone shipments fell 11% on the year in Q1. Samsung remained at the top as a shipping brand, growing its market share 2% on the year to 24%. Apple also stayed put at number two with market share up to 18%. Xiaomi, Oppo, and Vivo rounded out the top five, even as each saw declining market share on the year. Okta released a report on the breach it experienced back in January, saying a threat actor got control of one engineer's workstation at the support firm Cytel, as we previously suspected, for 25 minutes on January 21st. That was it. During that time, uh, the threat actor accessed two customers' accounts, uh, it viewed some information, but did not perform any configuration changes. It did not do any password or MFA resets. It did not impersonate customer support. Uh, it also could not authenticate to any Okta accounts. Uh, Okta had previously said that the upper limit was 366 customers that they could have possibly accessed. But after the investigation, the actual number it did was the open source social network Mastodon released its first official client for Android on the Google Play Store, although there are numerous third-party clients already available. Mastodon launched an iOS client back in July of last year. All right, let's talk about Netflix. Uh, if you get the extended show from Patreon, you already know, because we talked about it yesterday, uh, that Netflix reported overall it lost 200,000 subscribers in Q4. It had expected to gain 2.51 million. That's that's quite a difference. Uh, it actually gained 1.1 million subscribers in Asia Pacific, and then it lost 700,000 because it terminated service in Russia. And the rest of the difference is made up by a loss of 600,000 subscribers in Canada and the U.S. Netflix says it now expects to lose 2 million more subscribers this quarter. This is the first decline in subscribers in more than a decade for Netflix. And the knee-jerk analysis might be to blame the price increase. Uh, they've increased prices in North America and the UK. Netflix acknowledges that did have an effect. Uh, but keep in mind, Netflix earnings were $3.53 a share, beating expectations of $2.91. So their idea that revenue would increase even if subscribers stalled proved true. The other effect on subscribers is competition. Netflix acknowledged that. People have choices now. Lots of them. They're very good choices. But Netflix definitely had responses. Perhaps panic might be too strong a word, but the company has flipped its position on multiple issues, including password sharing, advertising, and maybe even live sports. Stick with me. Netflix said it estimates... About 100 million users share passwords. First time they've shared a number. Now, in the past, co-CEO Reed Hastings 
has said that password sharing was something you have to learn to live with. Didn't seem that upset about it. Was very meh, gentle about it. Now, he says, quote, when we were growing fast, it wasn't a high priority to work on, and now we're working super hard on it. Uh, you may recall that in Chile, Costa Rica, and Peru, Netflix has been testing a way of messaging people who share passwords and asking, not forcing them, to pay. Netflix says it will take what it learns from those tests, and now it's going to expand it worldwide in a year or so. First time they've committed to that. Uh, Netflix also did a total about face on ads. Hastings said, I've been against the complexity of advertising, but now he is, quote, quite open to offering even lower prices with advertising as a consumer choice. He says they're going to begin looking into how to do that over the next year or two. Don't expect it right away. Netflix has the advantage of a huge subscriber base and previous collaborations with brands on marketing. They have some relationships with Coca-Cola and that, but they don't have an ad model yet or infrastructure for serving ads. And the market is crowded. Peacock, Paramount Plus, HBO Max, Hulu, Disney Plus, they're all about to pitch advertisers at upfronts in the next month or so. And don't forget the fast services like Tubi and Pluto. And if that wasn't enough, the fact that Netflix is finally going to consider using ads, Netflix also softened its stance on live sports. Uh, usually it's a flat no when asked about it. But co-CEO Ted Sarandos said, I'm not saying that we'll never do sports, but we'll have to see a path to growing a big revenue stream and a great profit stream with it. That's similar to what they used to say about advertising. Well, we're not saying we'll never do it, but uh, now they're saying that about sports. Uh, Deadline even notes that Hastings told German newspaper Der Spiegel that it might consider buying the rights to F1 if it could get enough control, although Sarandos emphasized that sports-adjacent programming, like the Formula One Drive to Survive docuseries, is still the focus. Uh, Sarah, they're, they're just throwing everything against the wall, aren't they? Yeah, I know it's disappointing uh, for any company, but certainly Netflix, which has more competition than ever, to say, well, we thought we were going to gain over 2 million new subscribers, and instead we didn't lose that amount, but we certainly lost uh, several hundred thousand. Uh, and I, I know Russia plays into this you know, on one hand, but seeing the numbers decline in U.S. and Canada, that's been something that Netflix has been grappling with, but it had been growing in other markets. Uh, so, so quarterly results more or less played out the way that the company wanted it to. The password sharing thing, I mean, password sharing, I don't really know why the company had this stance of like, eh, it's just part of life. I mean, maybe just growing as quickly as they were growing for so long um, and getting so many new subscribers and enjoying people, uh, enjoying their original content, which brought in new, which brought in new subscribers was just enough to kind of go like, we don't have time for this right now. I'm sure the, I'm sure the concept of password sharing was never a, a non-issue, just something that wasn't a huge priority because you got to figure out the infrastructure on the inside to crack down on this sort of thing. You know, other companies do it, so so there's that. But uh, but yeah, I think the I think the live sports is interesting. That could certainly give Netflix an advantage going forward. I think the fact that advertising is an option for the company, but it might take them upwards of two years to implement that. Uh, is not going to help their next couple of quarters. And this following quarter coming up sounds like it's going to be a doozy as well. So I've got a notion that may be purely a notion and nothing else. I have no evidence to support what I'm about to say. Sometimes a great notion. Sometimes. Who knows what could spring from this amazing notion? So everybody at home, take note. Um, <laughs> here's what I think may have happened. Uh, I think when Netflix staked their claim early in this market and became the de facto sort of name you associated with streaming, um, that gave them a wide berth for a long time and didn't really uh, make much of a noise if you were going to try to compete against them. You sort of came and you went or you came and existed, but not much happened. Even the likes of Amazon with Prime Video, I think it came. Uh, they, they duplicated a lot of the features Netflix did, like it's bingeable. We mostly give you programming that's all at once, and then you watch it all at once with a few exceptions. Like in a lot of ways, it's a very comparable system, minus the fact that you get it with your, your overall Prime membership every year. Um, or at least initially, and now you can get it individually. The point is, like, that came, did its thing. Other little ones came along. CBS All Access popped up, and I feel like Netflix just kind of went, well, look at these guys. They're kind of poking at us, but it isn't any big deal. We're not really feeling threatened by any of this. And then it feels like very quickly, and all at once almost, pandemic played a part in this, but all of these services like Disney Plus and HBO Max, I mean, I think they even discounted HBO prior to this because they thought they were confusing. It's like, 
you've got go you've got now what what are you even hbo like it was confusing to me as a user of hbo so i, I imagine netflix just didn't see it as a serious threat and i think that's changed and it changed quickly and the likes of paramount plus uh which is what cbs all actually used to be um you know other services that are just kind of chipping away at them peacock and others I think it kind of caught them off guard just a tiny bit. And at the same time, they decided to raise prices during an inflationary time that's that's notably inflationary. <laughs> Which is what inflation is, raising prices. So Exactly. Kind of, so, you know, double-edged just, sword. You're kind yeah, of, exactly. kind of stuck, right? it, It's just some kind of bad timing. Yeah. So that I think that confluence of, of events is a little bit – they're usually prepared for this sort of stuff. And I feel like it caught them a little off guard in the larger sense. I, mm-hmm. I, you know, now that you've said this, it really crystallizes to me that I don't think Netflix was wrong. They didn't think password sharing was a big problem. They, they really thought that password sharing eventually caused people to become subscribers. They had the data on that. So I think they were going very slowly of like, okay, when we get to market saturation, maybe we can do some gentle things to nudge people out of password sharing to increase subscribers. But we don't want to push it because there is a discovery aspect of this we don't want to kill. I, they've said that, and I believe them. I think... It's the current unusual climate that has caused Netflix to be wrong for the first time in a decade. Uh, it is inflation, which nobody expected. I mean, yeah, lots of people expected it, but but really, when you're talking like years out, nobody said uh, in you know two years ago, like in 2022, there will definitely be inflation. Uh, the pandemic messing with the economy and supply lines, uh, the war in Ukraine, all of that has changed everything so much that Netflix is previous projections just don't hold anymore because all of the assumptions have changed. So with competition, with people concerned about spending money, with people concerned about the future, they're being pickier about what they spend their money on. Uh, And like you say, when there's inflation, that means you have to raise prices. But when you raise prices during inflation, that means people are less likely to want to spend money because of inflation. It's a, you know, it's a never ending circle. So I, I really, I really think that Netflix wasn't wrong it's just that the conditions have changed drastically, which is why we're seeing them drastically change their response to them. Agreed. Yeah. Well, and raising prices for, you know, might get you through a quarter, right? As far as, as you know, profit margin goes, but you also lose subscribers that way and it's not sustainable. Well, they, maybe. The, the other way it can go is you lose your subscribers right up front who are price sensitive, but then if you keep making money off that, you don't lose more because you haven't raised prices again. Right. Well, one of the challenges of relying on solar energy is that the Earth revolves. You might not know this, but it does. It's what? That means our star is not always visible. In fact, half of it isn't at any given moment. Some people refer to this as nighttime hmm, or darkness. That... Hmm. Some scientists at Stanford University figured they could do something about this, and then they did. And they published the results in the Applied Physics Letters Journal. Hat tip to Andrew Block over at CNET, where we first saw this reported. You might guess, okay, they figured out how to use more distant stars beyond the sun's light to generate energy, but that's not actually what they did. They took advantage of something called radiative cooling. So at night, without our star warming us, objects radiate heat into the sky and off into space. That radiation can cause an object to become cooler than the air around it. And then that difference in temperature can be used to generate a small amount of electricity. Electrical engineering professor Shang Hui Fan and team modified a solar panel to incorporate a thermoelectric generator to take advantage of radiative cooling during the night. They were able to generate 50 milliwatts per square meter. That's an order of magnitude above previous reported experiments and even adds a little power during the day when the solar panel is also generating normal solar energy. It is a lot less than the 200,000 milliwatts a solar panel would generally create during a given day, but it could be enough to charge batteries or operate nighttime lighting, power sensors, things like that. Of course, they'll keep working on the design to see how much more juice they can squeeze out of it. Do we find this to be practical? It's I mean, probably not going to be practical. Probably that, not, that, right? That's the consensus is like, this may not be practical. They might not make it out of the lab, but man, I hope they figure out how to get over that hump and make maybe, it practical. Yeah. Maybe practicality can, in this case, be defined as something like long-term power storage that's just always on a trickle uh, that is either for emergency reasons. I can think well, of Well, the practicality is about whether whether you can at scale cost-effectively create 
the the adaptation to the solar panels, I guess. Yeah, good point. Um, I, I just, I think there's a future where in a home, like not even talking industrial use here, in a home you could have some sort of trickle-charged backup that's just always going, and you don't count on it for things like, well, we need power right now. It's not like that. But if the power went out, you would have this stored up because for the last 90 days it's been trickle charging on the night the night vibes and uh and now you've suddenly got enough power to you know generate electricity for the next week or something while there's some major outage like things like that that seems more possible in the practicality department than say hey i'm gonna Mm. charge my car here or my phone will always be feeding off of this like i don't think we're talking about that stuff yet no, they're, they're going to have to get it above 50 milliwatts. They're going to have to make it easy to implement. And that is the biggest practicality problem is it's not doesn't look like from from what what the people who know this are saying. They had a guy from the University of Sydney quoted in that CNET article saying like, yeah, they can do it, but it's harder than it's worth at 50 milliwatts. So maybe they can make it easier. Maybe they can get it well above 50 milliwatts, because I do love that idea of like just a little bit of energy mm-hmm. uh, could, you know, keep a sensor going you, know, you keep keep a uh keep keep a battery you know trickle charged even if it's just like solar lights in your in your yard it wouldn't have to be solar they could they could be night charged instead yeah uh that there's some cool ideas here and 50 milliwatts as small as it is is way bigger than anybody's been able to use get thermoelectric power to work so that that's pretty good too yeah it's an advancement at the very least. So I mean, I think you know, to this day, a lot of people think, oh, okay, well, solar power works if it's a hot sunny day, you know, <laughs> and, and no other time, you know, if it's nighttime or even if it's cloudy, it's not going to work. And there are, you know, there there are other ways to harness mm-hmm. electricity. Turns out, and and solar does work when it's cloudy. I know because I have solar panels. It just, yeah. just doesn't work as well, but you know, it doesn't. Yeah. But work still, it does. If you are like, man, I wish I could talk to y'all on Twitter or Instagram about this, you can. Follow us at DTNS Show on Twitter or on Instagram, DTNS Picks, P I X. Go, follow us. We're there. Despite the ongoing rumble that the days of consoles are numbered, the number of handheld consoles seem to be proliferating. You got the Steam Deck, you got the Analog Pocket. They both have their dedicated fans. Uh, that make the hardware difficult to obtain if you want one. Uh, one is a powerful Nintendo Switch-like handheld, the, the Steam Deck. The other is a retro vintage emulator, that analog pocket, really cool. Another entrant in the retro category is the crank. Well, it's not crank-powered, but the the console with a crank, Playdate, which just began shipping for $180 from Panic the makers of Untitled Goose Game and Firewatch. It's tiny, 76 by 74 by 9 millimeters with a 400 by 241 bit black and white display, no backlight, yes, one bit, has Wi-Fi, a USB-C port, it's one bit, but it's got a USB-C port, uh, <laughs> headphone jack, game controls are a D-pad and two face buttons with a crank, uh, the crank comes uh, as a control, it comes in yellow or yellow, uh, Scott has ordered one, but like many folks, isn't getting it for a while, which means he hasn't put his hands on it. But you've been devouring the information about this, and we got all the reviews on Monday, had a chance to look those over. On paper, this may look like something that should not be as popular as it is, but are the reviews good, Scott? So far, yeah. Um, honestly, I was a little I was a little unsure how it would be received. Um, there's been a ton of delays, first of all, uh, with this thing. Uh, I want to say they announced it way back in, what was it, 20. 20- 18 maybe it was a while ago so they've been working on this thing for a long time the initial impression was oh you'll be able to charge it by cranking it not true um it doesn't doesn't work that way but it does charge nicely so here's the thing most people say it's really sturdy that it seems like it's made well with one exception every review i've read said the crank seems a little flimsy um i don't i'm not really surprised by that because it's kind of small it's a going to be flimsy by pure physics um i think uh there's maybe ways they could beef that up but Mm -hmm. anyway it uses a control mechanism um there are different ways i've seen this thing work uh there are games where you're meant to run back and forth using the crank and since it's sort of an analog device you can move forward and back at different speeds and this sort of thing um i think the biggest strength is at least the initial library launch which is being all published by panic the developer of both the device and software developers in their own right as you mentioned Um, Pretty good batch. Everybody seems pretty happy with that. But there's a lot of questions about what else is coming down the road. Will there be another big push of a bunch of titles at once? Or will we get a slow trickle-in effect from different devs? 
and will uh, developers and even just hobbyists start making stuff you can sideload onto the thing? The good news is you can uh, right out of the box. There's no need to jailbreak this thing or do any kind of weird DRM stuff. It just works that way. I happen to know there's a project um, where somebody is trying to to build a Game Boy original monochrome Game Boy emulator into this device so that you can play old ROMs of that. Legality aside, it's an interesting technology feat if they pull that off. Um, what I think is different here, though, because there's tons of this stuff available. As you mentioned, the Switch is a big deal and is a runaway success and has been since 2017. The Steam Deck, while early, uh, people are pretty excited about it. But these are higher to higher end devices that are designed to play everything from AAA titles down to indies. And they're full of DRM and they're not meant to be sort of a hobbyist uh, kind of concept. There are other competitors in that market that are making similar devices. And again, it feels like they're less hobby and more mainstream. Um, this is a weird little niche because the thing is tiny, no backlight, super retro looking. I think this is perfectly time for a bit of a retro revolution. There are a lot of gamers and a lot of people who want to be playing what they used to play. And seeing this on my own retro video game show, uh, tons and tons of people getting interested in homebrew methods of ret of, uh, of uh, playing old vet retro games. And this, while not a retro device per se, is clearly aimed at that market. Here's your one bit, no color screen. It doesn't have a backlight. It's very small. It plays simple gameplay. But sometimes simple gameplay are the best mechanics, and we miss that sort of thing. We're, we're kind of tired of the huge stories. We want just, does something play well? I think this plays into that. And I also think the developer just has a ton of goodwill behind them. They're a, a developer of very popular games. You mentioned Firewatch, an incredible first-person exploration game. Untitled Goose Game is an insane little thing. They even make an FT, FTP client for Mac called, uh, uh, oh, shoot, I forgot the name of the thing. Uh, have it right here. Why don't I know the name of this? Anyway, oh, uh, Transmit, which I've used for years. Mm -hmm. uh, a very odd uh, company. They make all these crazy things. And I think that's part of the charm here is this, this small thing. It's not some massive developer making it. It's not some big company, electronics company. It's this little thing that you can carry around. It's affordable. It's neat. Is it going to turn the world on its end? No, but I think there's room for a device like this. Why do you think there's a you put it as a retro revolution going on in gaming i mean i know when it comes to fashion everything old gets new again uh that the that the nostalgia factor obviously plays into it but but what is it about gaming that makes people so eager to have something that yeah might be a little simple might be a little flimsy kind of looks old on purpose and 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 gives you the opportunity to to go back into the library i think the i think you kind of nailed it with the clothes thing. It may not be as cyclical though. Um, I think what it comes down with, with gamers or down to with gamers is they remember game experiences, devices of a certain era because it, that was an important era to them. Maybe they were kids then or they were in high school or that's when they discovered video games or mm -hmm. whatever it may be. So the sights and sounds of those eras just resonate with them and stay with them. Even if they keep up and they're like really into the latest and greatest, there's still this like, desire to feel what you feel again playing Zelda for the first time or whatever whatever the game may be and again this device is not coming out with a bunch of old games on it it's just presenting a bunch of new games in the old-fashioned way and I think that in itself is a hook because it says well these aren't just retro these are new and retro like we're appealing to both your sensibilities of wanting to play something new but also we want to do it in a, in a presentation and in a tone that you're yeah like you putting out a for. black and white new film exactly it's yeah. exactly that so uh to sum it up i just think that they were smart to know that this would hit those sweet spots for people i think the the reviews are finally nice to see though that they it looks like they accomplished their goal what people do from from here forward going to be really interesting. It'll either kind of go a little flat or the indie community is going to go nuts with it. And we're going to be flooded with really rad, cool little experiences that we wouldn't have had in any other way. So I am voting for option two personally. Well, if you haven't heard of a company called the air company, uh, it sells vodka, hand sanitizer, perfume. And you might say, hmm, that's kind of interesting for one company. Here's the twist as the company name implies these are created out of air, creating pure ethanol with the only inputs being CO2, water, and solar energy. A lot of solar on the show today. Back in 2019, the air company launched 
the world's first alcoholic beverage made directly from carbon dioxide called air vodka. But it's it's water. It's it's not just air. <laughs> During the pandemic, the company used all this access to alcohol to start making hand sanitizer. Remember when hand sanitizer was almost impossible to find? Worked out well for them. Now the company creates what it describes as carbon negative alcohols and consumer products simply from, again, CO2, with a goal to directly reverse carbon levels using conversation uh, conversion technology. Now, this is somewhat of a PR spin, but, you know, if you're trying to clean up the planet and you are able to do that and you also give people vodka, a lot of people are going to be pretty happy <laughs> with you. A new factory that the company's building will house newly designed commercial scale carbon utilization systems that's dedicated to increasing the production of CO2 derived ethanol and sustainable fuels. Yeah, I, I would like to see some numbers on how much electricity is used to make this uh, versus how much CO2 is removed to make it. Uh, but I found an article from the Brookhaven National Lab, actually a, a press release from them from back in September. And I imagine what they're doing is something similar to what Brookhaven has been doing, which is depositing tiny amounts of copper cesium onto a surface of zinc oxide. And that catalyzes the conversion of CO2. Uh, to ethanol. It sounds like the air company is trying to commercialize that. And if you're actually taking more CO2 out of the air than you're generating by the electricity you use, then yes, everybody drink more. We can we can reduce yeah. the CO2 in the atmosphere. Yay. We've I love the idea it. that this, I love the idea that the, the part of the industry that made a lot of money early in the pandemic, because we didn't know how COVID was transferred so much, they made a lot of money on hand sanitizer. And it turned out it wasn't as important because it's an airborne virus and blah, blah, blah. And this hand yeah, sanitizer yeah, yeah. Okay. thing wasn't as needed. So I like when I hear that these guys are like, all right, we're going to do something that might have a nice impact over here. I don't know why. Just for me, that, mm. that takes them out of jail a little bit. Not that they were in big trouble. But you know what I mean? Mm. Just, mm -hmm. just this much. Yeah. <laughs> also, hand sanitizer is still useful. <laughs> I know. It's totally useful. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. But there was a time there when there was a scarcity. And don't was, drink hand sanitizer. Yeah, don't do that. Don't do that. All right, let's check out the mailbag. Let's do it. Frank heard our story about the Exploding Kittens Netflix TV show and video game tie-in. This reminded Frank of a show and game that was released on the Sci-Fi Channel back in 2013 called Defiance, alongside an MMO of the same name. Frank says, my issue with the show game tie-in concept is I'd be in a world where I'm caught up in events rather than helping shape them. There's always been a drawback with MMOs for this reason for me, and for a TV show to try and draw in more players or vice versa, wasn't a big selling point. What has drawn me to video games is my ability to shape the events in the game versus being swept up on them. That feeling you get when you accomplish something and the engagement from the TV show to the audience is especially gratifying. Defiance developed a system where events on the show would impact the game, placing the player in a reactive position, which was cool, but not particularly satisfying. Frank says, I don't expect a game like Exploding Kittens to be as ambitious as Defiance was, but I feel as though the takeaway that Netflix could learn is that people like to have a piece of the action. What I'd like to see is myself making a kitten explode. Frank says, I don't even really know if that's what happens in the game, but you know, <laughs> let's just say that happens. And feel the impact of that exploding kitten on the TV show. Not necessarily a shout out to the gamer, but more knowing that what I do in the game affects the games on the show, like a choose your own adventure game. Interesting. Um, yeah, there's some big differences here. I played, I played uh, Defiance and I watched the show when it was on. And the promise there was bigger than they delivered. Um, it was a really cool promise, but they didn't quite get it. And the idea was that things that were happening in the game were going to affect plot points in the, in the show. And they did, but they just weren't significant. There were things that happened in the show that definitely affected the world as well. Um, and it was okay. And it was actually a pretty cool game. I think it just didn't, you know, it never got the legs that it wanted, neither did the show. Um, in fact, I think the game ran a little longer than the show did, which was also a little bit weird. But in this case, you're talking about a card game and you're talking about cute little fuzzy characters created by uh, the artists behind the oatmeal, which is a very, very popular webcomic. And I think that that stuff can kind of separately survive on its own. Think of it a little bit like Arcane and League of Legends. Uh, Arcane is based on that world, but that world and Arcane don't really need each other to function. So I, I do think there's plenty of room for other ways to do this. They don't all have to dive, you know, dive into each other's realms back and forth um, the way that the way that Defiance did, as cool as that idea was, I, I don't know that that's necessary. For what, if, what if Netflix had a choose-your-own-adventure version of the Exploding Kitties games that knew 
what you had done in the game because it's all Netflix on the back end. I mean, that would be rad. Well, and I, I think we're like getting that. there. We're yeah. getting to a place where this stuff is hap going to happen in some other, you know, other form. And, I, you know, it's not that different than when Lost had a website somewhere that you could go to and read yeah, yeah. stuff or even Severance has mm -hmm. a whole thing and an audio book and all this other stuff. That kind of connected tissue is really fun, especially when you're talking about genre TV. But in video game to TV, TV to video game, haven't quite figured out how to, to bridge that. But I'm not saying we won't. I just think it's, we're a little ways off. The biggest difference is Defiance was set in a St. Louis that had mountains, and Exploding Kittens is not. Right, that's good. Nor point. does St. Louis have mountains. <laughs> they got them cool arches, though. So. A little yeah. artistic license happening here. Well, Art thanks, Frank. Artistic license. Get it. <laughs> For, thanks, Frank, for the uh, thoughtful email. Thanks to everybody who sends us emails. Keep it coming. Feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. Also, thanks to you, Scott Johnson, for being with us today. What has been happening, my man? Well, there's a lot going on. I figured since we talked about that um, play date, it's a perfect time to recommend my show, uh, which deals with retro gaming. And we're probably going to talk a lot about that device once I get mine uh, over there as well. But the show is called Play Retro, and it's exactly what you think it is. We spent our entire last episode talking about the weird transition from 2D to 3D when console mascots were trying to make that jump, and most of them failed. A couple of them succeeded wildly, mostly Mario 64, but it was a rough time, and we looked at the history of that and found it fascinating. I think you might as well, so check it out, frogpants.com slash play retro, or just get it wherever you get your podcast. Just search for play retro and check the show out, see what you think. Also want to extend a special thanks to Arnob, who's one of our top lifetime supporters for DTNS. Thank you for all the years of support, Arnob. I realized the past two days I've asked people to become new subscribers and instead uh, we went down by one. So today, don't become a new subscriber at <laughs> patreon.com slash DTNS. That's don't, reverse don't psychology it. at its best. Wink. E face. There's a longer version of the show called Good Day Internet available at patreon.com slash DTNS. We roll right into it after this show, but we are live here on DTNS Monday through Friday, 4 p.m. Eastern, 2000 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. And we're back tomorrow with Len Peralta and Allison Sheridan. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>